we're almost at the halfway point in our Lenten journeys. So it's a good time to take stock of where we are and where we've been and where we're going in order to finish this journey and arrive at the destination that we have in mind for ourselves. We're setting the course. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about where we've been in the last couple of weeks. Pastor Katie launched us into Lent by an examination of our human condition, our failings and our frailty, yet at the same time our belovedness because of God's concern and care for us. And on the second Sunday of Lent, which was last week, Christina LaSalle Peterson preached and reminded us of the determination that Christ displayed to complete the work for which he came to earth, our salvation on the cross, and nothing would deter him, not threats or plots against him, nothing. He said he will finish the course and he will preach the next day and the next and go where he's supposed to go. So where does that leave us today? Well, the lectionary passages for this day are this converging location between our great need and God's great remedy in Christ. And where human need and divine mercy meet, there we find the call and the blessed fruit of repentance. Now, admittedly, repentance is not always a pleasant thought or theme for us to think about because we associate it so often with harsh, harsh judgment or with guilt that paralyzes us at times, or we equate it with shame, which is not a good feeling at all and not something that God wants for us either. And we think of John the baptizer and his words, you brood of vipers, come and repent. His speech was not gentle and mild like Jesus. And we think of Jesus as always being the opposite of John the Baptist, always soothing, always comforting. But here, the gospel passage for today shows us Jesus sounding very much like his cousin John. We know the backstory, or actually their backstories, that precipitate this exchange between Jesus and those asking him questions. And we have Jesus' surprisingly unsettling response, but we don't know the exact questions that were asked of him. We don't have that in scripture. But we can make some assumption from his responses that those asking presumed that there was a relationship between sin and calamity. And that was a very common belief in that time. If someone was facing a problem, they must have done something to bring that on themselves. So you remember, like in John 9, when the disciples see a man who is blind, they say, now who sinned, Jesus? Was it him or was it his parents that brought this on? And Jesus tells them that that's not the case at all. So two events of his day were considered. These would have been two headlining stories in the daily news. First, there were a group of Galilean worshipers who were bringing their sacrifices, as the faithful were expected to do. And for reasons not stated, Pilate ordered them killed and their own blood mixed with their sacrifices. Now, Pilate's cruelty was well known. And Jesus, too, would suffer under Pilate. But eventually, Pilate was even put out of power by the Romans because the Romans didn't have the stomach for how cruel Pilate was. So Pilate has this um, reputation of just being really, really bad, okay? The second news story is that 18 people are killed when the Tower of Siloam falls on them. And apparently, to attempt to feel safe or maybe superior, people asked Jesus, what had these people who have been slain, either by human cruelty or by this accident, done to bring this disaster on themselves? Or a question of that nature. But Jesus responds in a way that's quite contrary, I must, ask, I must say, to those of us who have uh, taken pastoral care principles or taught that, he says, 
Do you think that they were worse offenders than you? No. <laughs> and unless you repent, you're all going to perish like they did. There was no answer of why bad things happen in this world. There was no assurance that these people so desired that sin is correlated with disaster. So if you just be good, nothing will befall you of this nature. And there was no calming of anxieties about the dreadful things that sometimes are experienced in the world. And most of all, there was no explanation of how God acts so that we can always predict 100% sure, surely knowing what God will do. There was just an urgent call to repentance and an or else statement that hangs in the air. An urgent call. Urgency is a theme running through today's passages from Jesus. Unless you repent, you will perish as they did. From 1 Corinthians, do not be carried away by temptation. Watch out lest you fall. And from Isaiah, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he might have mercy upon them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Seek, call, forsake, return with urgency. Now, usually the Old Testament readings sound a bit more stringent to our ears. And in the New Testament, we think of Jesus talking always in soothing ways, usually. But in today's passage, what we read in Isaiah sounds like comfort and grace and salve to our souls. It's an invitation home. In a literal sense, God's people were exiled, carried away from their homes and captive in a foreign land for decades. But in a spiritual sense, too, they were in exile. They wondered where God's promises and protection and provisions were. They became so used to their location, physically and spiritually, that they settled in and they didn't dare hope for more. They were forced to buy even their basic necessities from the oppressive system which held them captive. In Lamentations chapter 5, which is uh, parallel to this in time, the exiles complain of the high cost of necessities, things that had been free, now they had to pay for like water and wood to keep warm for heat. And now it was time for them to return to their homeland. But it is a home that they're returning to that is completely unfamiliar to them. The older generation has passed away, and all they have passed on is remembrances of what home was like. But these younger ones returning have never been there. So they're going home to a home they've never known was home before. God speaks the invitation through the prophet with this attention-grabbing, Ho! Or, hey there, something's coming. Come. God will be a provider for you. Don't worry about money. Enjoy the provision of a loving, caring parent of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Return to home, a future and a hope. Are you thirsty? Well, there's abundant fresh water here. Are you hungry? Well, he's prepared for you a rich feast, and it's freely offered and freely received without price, without cost. You don't need money here. Now, wait a second here. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat is dry. <coughs> We're talking about a feast in Lent. Huh. Is this an appropriate passage for a season where fasting is the traditional observance, not feasting? Well, it is, dear friend. Because we fast from those things that cannot nourish our souls, 
We fast from things that can never satisfy in order, in order to more clearly see the richness of God's abundance toward us in his love, mercy, pardon, redemption, steadfast care, compassion, and concern. That's the divine feast. Come home, a place to rest in God and enjoy God's presence and provision. And it's a place of hope and a future, too. If the lectionary reading in Isaiah included the rest of the chapter, then we would read about rains watering the earth and making it sprout and grow grains that would make abundant bread and provide seed for future sowing and more abundant bread. There's going to be this ongoing future for the people of God. It's rich and plenteous food for the future and joy and peace and God's word too, just like the grain giving forth what it's supposed to give to us, God's intentions, and continuing on, not coming back to God void, but accomplishing the very purpose that God sets it out to do. There's a future. I can't help but think of the Ukraine when I read this passage from Isaiah. The Ukraine is Europe's breadbasket. And beyond Europe, even, even some of the grain that the U.S. receives comes from the Ukraine. And that's why there are predictions that our cereals and things like that will increase in cost because we even are recipients of that grain. And when I see the pictures of people fleeing and families and people as they leave with just small bags of belongings, not knowing where they'll be tomorrow, I think of this. This is the season where they would be planting grain. They would be getting ready to plant grain. And instead of preparing to plant those seeds, they're consumed in a fight to retain their freedom. And so we continue to pray. Many of you probably know the history between Ukraine and uh, Russia. In 1932, Stalin had this plan of how to take over the Ukrainian people. And he would do it by taking away their ability to grow grain. And so Stalin and Russian forces took all of the land on which grain would be grown. And they didn't let anything be planted or any Ukrainians harvest. It's called the Holodormer. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it exactly correctly as Ukrainian would have it pronounced. But... In night, between 1932 and 1933, this was called the terror famine. Stalin starved the people. Looking back at how many people died and figuring it out, like how many deaths per minute, 17 Ukrainians per minute died of starvation for over a year. I invite you to look at the history there to understand a little bit more of what's happening today in that part of the world. And there are movies about that as well, um, one called The Bitter Harvest and one called Mr. Jones. This is the season to plant grain. And we pray for the Ukraine that there again would be grain there. There would be joy and peace again and safety and a recognition also of their need, of all of humanity's need of God's great provision. It strikes me that the Isaiah 55 passage is an invitation, but it comes with a warning. And the gospel passage is a warning, but it comes with this urgent invitation. So I can see why they're paired with one another here. Come, we hear in Isaiah, but do not delay because tomorrow is not promised. You may hear someone say, I have all the time in the world. Well, nobody is guaranteed that and no one knows. 
We don't know what the next moments will bring. We don't know what the next day will bring or the next year. We can't plan that far ahead. And in Isaiah, we hear, come while God may be found. Come while God is near. The opportunity to come isn't forever because we aren't without limits. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That starts our season. Cruelty kills people, as we see in the story of Pilate, or as we see in the news today. Accidents happen. Illness takes lives. The future is not guaranteed. So today is the day of salvation, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This moment, this is the acceptable time to hear and heed the invitation, come home. And to come home, we repent and we accept a new and restored life. See, repentance is not about something harsh. Repentance is an offer of something good, a different direction that brings fulfillment and joy, that leads to the kind of satisfaction and restoration that we all long for in our lives. And while the Isaiah passage holds out an invitation to the exiled of all ages, including us, with a warning to not delay, the gospel passage is Jesus giving a warning, repent or else disaster will follow your soul. But he adds the parable of, of the fig tree, and therein is the invitation. There's this fruitless tree taking up space and nutrients from the soil, but not producing what it was intended for, not bearing the fruit which it should bear. So the landowner determines it's worthless and should be cut down and thrown away. But the gardener, closer to the care of that tree, says, perhaps with a little extra care, perhaps with just a little more time and fertilizer, maybe it wouldn't be barren anymore. Maybe it could be fruitful. Just a bit more time, please. But it isn't unlimited time. There still is an urgency there. God's ways are above ours. God's thoughts are above our own. God is a God who gives second chances. God is a God who holds out an invitation that says, but don't delay in taking that invitation. In 2 Peter, we read, The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's the invitation. That's the invitation for Lent. And repentance is not just a one-time thing, because as in our children's sermon we heard here, you can get lost and forget where you're headed and need to find the way back. So the invitation is there, but it's urgent. And we're supposed to RSVP right now. Repent, s'il vous plaît. Repentance leads to second chances and restored abundant life. And that's the message of Lent. That's the urgent invitation. Won't we all accept?